I'm archaeologist Dr. Brad Hafford, and today I'm going to be reacting to a video that was posted recently by Mini Minuteman, Milo Rossi. Now, Milo does a great job of debunking conspiracy theories that have to do with ancient artifacts and archaeological sites. Most archaeologists don't spend a lot of time trying to do that because, well, the leaps of logic that are involved with the people that want to believe the conspiracy theories are pretty convoluted and it's difficult to convince them otherwise they really want to believe in this. So you can show them all of the evidence and then they will claim that you are just ignoring their evidence and trying to maintain the status quo or something like this. Well, it means that you could spend your time in a much more valuable way by doing your own research and kind of forgetting about the conspiracy theories. I'm glad that Milo takes it on. He's got a lot of personality, a lot of bravado. It's a really interesting series of videos that he does and I hope that he continues. Now this particular object is related to some conspiracies but it actually could be what people claim that it is and that is an ancient battery and it's closer to my field of expertise. I'm a Near Eastern archaeologist. I work primarily in Iraq now. This one was found in Iraq and I covered it in a podcast. Don't wreck yourself. It's a lot of fun. It's done by Ryan Placetti and Matt St. Singh. We went over a lot of different things and the Baghdad battery came up and I'd done very basic research on it and said, well, you know, maybe it could be a battery. We don't really know. It certainly didn't power ancient lights. Well, this is the kind of research most people do. If you search for the Baghdad battery, you're going to find uh, some basic things, but you're not going to find the original data. You've got to dig for that. And so I became more and more interested in it after I did the podcast and after I'd heard that Milo was going to be covering it. So I'm going to watch Milo, see what he has to say, interrupt sometimes and say what I have found and talk about how that compares with what he's saying. The Baghdad Battery was an artifact discovered in the Iraqi city of Salman Pak, which at the time was known as Rajut Rabu. And the location where the batteries were discovered is located about 15 miles to the south. While today this settlement is known as Salman Pak, in antiquity it was known as al Madain, as is indicated by my terrible handwriting. It's true that you might think that it was found in Baghdad, but it was not. But it was found on the outskirts of Baghdad. He says that it's in Kuyut Rabua, and that's true. But what does that name mean? mean. There are conflicting reports and uh, in many cases in Iraq we find the same name applied to many different places. So I found these conflicting reports. The very earliest one in 1938 says that it's southeast of Baghdad, which is what he's showing, but it also says it's on the train line to Kirkuk, which is north of Baghdad. So I finally found um, a great resource from 1964 from someone who was working in the National Museum in Iraq. And they gave us the specific information that we're going to need. In the course of earth moving operations carried out in June 14, 1936, by the Iraq State Railways Department at mile 4 slash 4 on the Baghdad Bakuba line, where a series of hillocks known locally as Kuyut Rabua, some two miles off the Baghdad Eastern Bund, the workmen came across an ancient burial covered with stone slab. So he's reporting that the Earth moving was originally done by the rail department, but not for the building of the railway. This was, as other reports say, it was to get dirt to fill in low-lying areas where mosquitoes were breeding. And they say that they found a grave. They did, but that's why they called in the antiquities department. They then began an excavation of this site, and they say that it's a Parthian settlement. So this tells us that it's on the Baghdad Bakuba line at four miles north of Baghdad. So it's not at Salman Pak. And because this site is located along such an important arterial river, it has seen human habitation for thousands of years. And because of that, it is home to countless archeological sites. One of the most impressive being Tak Kasra, which is the remains of a Persian palace. Salman Pak is, essentially it's where ancient Ctesiphon was. And as Milo mentions, that's where the Tak Kasra is. Now that is an archway, an iwan, that was once part of the king's palace. Really impressive. In fact, um, it has seen some recent collapse of brick, which is really unfortunate, and it has made us all quite worried. So I've been part of a project that has been helping to reinforce it, and we've erected 
specialty scaffolding, and this thing is 30 meters high, so it's enormous. And we're installing crack monitors and trying to figure out where the stresses are so that we can try to make sure that this ancient building will stay standing for centuries to come. Okay, back on track. Almadane is undoubtedly the most well-known for the discovery of the Baghdad Battery, which I should state right off the bat is a very sensationalized name. By calling it the Baghdad Battery, you are already told to assume its purpose. It's very similar to calling the Dendera Carving the Dendera Light. Yeah, I agree. It's not a good name. To call it a battery means you know it's a battery, and in fact, we don't know that. And the more I've researched, the less I believe it. I really wanted to believe that it is battery and it, and it could have been, the people were smart enough to make one, but I don't think they did. So yeah, misleading name. He also says that al Medain is best known for finding the Baghdad battery. I doubt that's true. It's best known for Tessafon and the Takisra. So the Baghdad battery is a bit of a sensationalized name which is given to a discovery which could very easily be called the Parthian Jars due to the fact that they were created by the Parthian Empire which existed from about 200 BCE to about 200 AD. Yeah, they could be called the Parthian Jars and I think that that's um, not a bad name because that's essentially what they are. The place they were found was reported as a Parthian settlement and Parthians were uh, around from roughly 200 BCE to 200 CE. Um, but the best reports I can find tend to say that this is probably late Parthian, so it's closer to that 200 CE date, most likely. There are Comparanda for the Baghdad Battery, and they tend to come from the Sasanian period, which is just after the Parthian, up to about 650 CE. And because they were discovered in 1936, the actual recordings of their discovery are sparse, if not unrecorded entirely. As in the 1930s, there was, by and large, very little care taken for archaeological diligence, as much of it was, unfortunately, a for-profit business. Even everyone's favorite Hollywood archaeologist acknowledges this in Indiana Jones. Okay, I'm probably going to get a little defensive here now. Um... To call all archaeologists from the 1930s for-profit and essentially just looters trying to take artifacts and sell them, I think that's unfair. It is true that they were not the same diligence that we have today. The museums hired them to go and investigate and bring back half of the finds. The other half stayed in the country for their museums. But most archaeologists, certainly good ones, and I would, I would hope that the vast majority of them, even in that period, were mostly concerned with finding out how ancient people lived. That's what we do. So yeah, I'm probably defending archaeologists too much, but the other thing that yeah, kind of irks me is that he's using Indiana Jones as an example. Indiana Jones is a fiction. Maybe they researched some archaeology when they created that character, but he is not representative of all archaeologists of the 1930s. We do know that the Baghdad Battery was first analyzed by Wilhelm Koenig. In 1938, he was the director of the Museum of Antiquities in Baghdad. But the problem is we have no idea where it was actually found. Yes, it was analyzed by Wilhelm Koenig. In 1938, he published a short article about it in German. That's the earliest record that I can find. And most people don't read that one because it's old, it's harder to find, and it's in German. He was not the director of the museum, though. He was the director of the museum's laboratory. And he really wanted to believe they were batteries. So, yeah, he started the kind of concept. To the best of our knowledge, the jars were discovered as part of the excavation for a rail line in 1936. We don't know if they were discovered by Koenig, who was an acting archaeologist at the time, or if they were discovered by a worker and just donated to the museum. Okay, um, to the best of our knowledge, they were not found in the excavation of a rail line. They were dug by the rail company but they were moving dirt in order to do something else. The rail was already built. This was a line that was going north of Baghdad, it was going to Bakuba, and it was going up to Kanakin and to Kirkuk. So uh, he says, we don't know who found it. We do know who found it in Al Haik in Sumer 1964. And he was reading the actual reports from the dig in 1936. Now, as far as I can tell, that was never published, but the records that the archeologists took were kept in the Iraq Museum and by this 1964 article, he says, people are really interested in this so-called battery, so I'm going to give some more information. And he reports some of the information that came from that original dig. Now, that was 30 years in the past at that point, but it's the best record we have because it seems to be a direct connection. We now have the Iraq Museum numbers of the Baghdad battery. It has three numbers. Why? Because it's got a jar, it's got a copper cylinder that was in the jar, and it's got an iron rod or nail. 
This will help if we can ever try to locate them again. Either way, it is very important to remember uh, for this story going forward that we don't actually know what these jars were like in situ. When an artifact is found in situ and you remove it, you are removing all of the context that that artifact once had. And in doing that, you can lose more information than you would by just having the artifact. Yes, he's absolutely right. Context is vital. That is what archaeologists are looking at, analyzing, understanding. An artifact by itself doesn't really say much. Maybe it's pretty, you can put it on display, but what does it really say? How was it used? Who made it? How, uh, what did they think about it, if you can get there? That comes from understanding the context. Where was it found? Had it been left in place? Had it been thrown on the trash? There are so many things that could happen, but you've got to try to interpret it all, so you definitely have to have it in place. Either way, that's a long way of saying that we have absolutely no idea where these jars came from, which to us as archaeologists is probably the most important piece of information that we could ever ask for. The find is supposedly around 2200 years old, but of course we can't be sure because this analysis was done in the 1930s and they were taken out of context. And the find consisted of four unglazed ceramic jars. All right, here's the biggest mistake that we all make. I made it when I was talking about it on the podcast and... Uh, Milo's making it right here. If you type this in and you try to do some research on the Baghdad battery, they're gonna tell you it was found in a group of four. It was not. Uh, the one from Kuyut Rabawa in 1936 was found on its own. There was only one from that site. Across the river, Tigris, from Tessaphon, is the site called Seleucia. Now that was dug by Leroy Waterman. And in 1930, he reports four of these jars very much like the so-called Baghdad Battery. Now, when Koenig talked about this in 1938, he talks about the one that he was analyzing, and then he goes and he looks for comparenda, similar objects that probably served a similar function. And he found these four that Waterman had excavated in 1930. So that's why people conflate it. They read, or maybe they read someone who has read this, or they're getting secondary or tertiary reports and not going to the original. So in the original German, he says, got this one, okay, here's these other four, I'm going to compare them to. So I went and found Waterman's original reports. And that tells us a great deal about the fine spot of the four that everybody thinks are the Baghdad batteries. Now, let's read a little bit of that. The sealed jar is one of four examples found during the closing days of the 1930 season at Trial Trench 30, all are small jars from six to eight inches in height of very common unglazed ware, but of different types. Two have a handle and the other two have none. All were sealed with bitumen stoppers and each was held in place by small rods set upright at the ends and sides. These rods were from six to 10 inches long and projected slightly above the jars. Each jar had one iron rod, the rest being of bronze. Each of the three horizontally placed jars contained a small bronze cylinder originally sealed at both ends. Each cylinder originally contained what appears as a tightly wrapped roll, though in one instance, owing to the loosening of the ends of the cylinder, the contents had become a mass of mere flakes. A second roll had partially disintegrated so that only a small, closely wrapped core is preserved. The third appears to be intact and gives the impression of a roll of paper folded over at the ends. There you go. We've got all three of the ones that are lying down. They have papyrus inside the copper roll, and all of them have sort of spikes holding the jar in place. They're on the edges and sticking up above the jar to hold them down. So this is a very interesting analysis that nobody talks about. When Milo says we don't know anything about them in situ, about the ones at Seleucia, we absolutely do know. And it is very interesting. We'll analyze it in a minute. Of the four jars that were found, one of them contained a piece of heavily deteriorated papyrus, and the other three contained a cylindrical tube made out of copper, as you can see here in my artist's rendering. Each one of the copper tubes is equipped with a bottom which was soldered on with lead, and of these three which were found to contain a copper tube, one of them was found with a iron rod which was held in place in the copper tube by an asphalt plug. Okay, not all of this is true. Uh, he's talking about the Seleucia ones now, and none of those had an iron rod inside. Only the one at Kuyu Rabua had that. Three of them had copper cylinders, and all three of those had papyrus, so he's wrong when he says one had papyrus. The one that didn't have a copper cylinder had the remains of a glass flask in it, and it was standing upright. The others were all laying down. So it's a confusion of information here, and we're not hearing the full story. 
Something which I was very confused about when I was researching this was the usage of the term asphalt. But asphalt is just a, another name for bitumen. They did all have bitumen, and the bitumen is the way that they sealed this together. Bitumen is just um, crude oil, really. It, it, Iraq has oil, bubbles up from the ground sometimes, becomes very viscous, and they used it in the ancient world as a, an all-around glue, sometimes as a mortar, and as a waterproofing substance. So it's quite common in use in the ancient world. Now again, I want to make really, really clear while we have all four of these drawn that only one of them has the asphalt plug and the iron rod in it. The other three are functionally completely different from one another. And I want to make really clear that um, this is not the full story and we're looking at conflated information here. We do have only the one with an iron rod, so he is right in many cases. I'm not trying to make fun of him. I'm just saying that as so many people have done, it's really hard to get the real information, so they've made mistakes. And even with all of the information, I'm not necessarily right. I don't know what these really are. But when he says that the others are functionally different, I think he's wrong. I think these are functionally the same. They just have some variations. And remember that I mean, his drawing shows four identical jars. They're not identical. Um, even at the Seleucia ones, two of them were missing that neck. Basically, this is a, a fairly common jar type in the Sasanian period. It's piriform. It comes up like a pear and comes over to a shoulder and then up to a very narrow neck. And that neck has a handle on it. Well, if you break that neck off, you get what looks like what we're showing here is a Baghdad jar uh, or a Baghdad battery. We've got the copper in them. We've got the bitumen in them and the papyrus in them. So I think it's not right to say that they are functionally different. There was some theorization that these ones did also contain an iron rod at some point because there was other iron rods found at the grave site, supposedly. But again, we have no records of the grave site and we have no evidence that these were ever implemented as part of this apparatus. So every single thing that we have to support this conspiracy going forward is based off of just this, a single jar. So here is my wonderful uh, rendition of the Baghdad battery. The final piece of evidence that Koenig found to suggest to him that this was some sort of uh, electric cell was the presence of a residue which suggested an electrolyte within the container. Koenig never says that. He did not have proof of acid. So there's another very good article written by Emmerich Pastori in 1985. Uh, it was written in German, so a lot of people aren't reading it, but it analyzes all of the evidence, and it does a great job. He did some scientific analysis of these objects after a, an exhibit in Germany uh, that included the Baghdad battery and other versions of it. And when he analyzed it, he did find lead carbonates, which are deterioration products from the lead. He never talks about an acid corrosion, and no one really does. There's one mention that says, after the war, meaning World War II, Someone looked at this and found acid corrosion. And Milo often says, especially about conspiracy theorists, that they'll, they'll refer to an experiment and they won't tell you what, that, what was found or how it was done. You have to have the experiment and be able to understand that it was using good techniques or whatever. So there we go. Now Koenig's deduction from all of this was that what he was looking at was the remains of an ancient battery. And that idea spread like wildfire. Yes, Koenig definitely wanted to believe it was a battery. And he said that if you put some form of acid into that copper cylinder with the iron sticking into it, you would get a charge and you would. So he wanted to believe that and other people thought, wow, this is a great idea. So yeah, it caught on. And then some engineers or people who look at that and say, from the drawings that Koenig made and everything, yes, that could be a battery, and then they make copies of that, of the idealized thing, and find out that it can give a charge. So yes, if all of these other things are true, it could have been a battery. A themed drink every single video. I, I am no mixologist, so to undertake this enormous operation, I have partnered with uh, Rhode Island Foodie, they ate a drink which we are going to call the Baghdad Battery. Yeah, Milo is a lot of fun, and I like that he's teaming up with a mixologist, and the drink he's making sounds great. I think I'm tempted. All right, Baghdad Battery. Wow, now that's good. If you want the recipe, 
can go to Newport, Rhode Island Foodie on TikTok or on YouTube. Yeah, I was missing amaretto and I think one other thing, but it still makes a really good drink. So I think at this point, it is safe to say that we can all agree that this was not a device used to power electric lights. But there is one part of this conspiracy which I still haven't been able to dispel yet, and that is whether or not it was a battery. As we saw in the experiments carried out by Mythbusters and by Smith University, the Baghdad battery is actually capable of producing power. It is, to be fair, an infinitesimal amount in comparison to how much you would need to actually run a power grid, and it is still a one-off find but it's kind of hard to argue with that. It, it, it can function as a battery if you construct it in the idealized way. See, that's, I think, the problem. Once Koenig decided it was a battery and he did the drawing to show that the copper cylinder would be in there and then the iron rod would go inside, then yes, people ran with that. But you would then need to make sure that the bitumen holds it in place so much that you can still get a contact on the copper and a contact on the iron. Those were completely covered with bitumen, and in some cases, they were inside the neck of the jar. And we don't have any wires to make those contacts anyway, so the logistics on this thing, they just wouldn't work. While there is not a single archaeologist who believes that the Baghdad battery was used to power ancient electric lights, there are some theories that it was used with an electrical application just for something else. That something else being electroplating. Despite sounding like it's a lot more grounded in reality, uh, there are a couple reasons why I think that this theory is erroneous at best. Firstly, the one volt that you're going to be getting from this battery probably would not be enough to really effectively electroplate anything. And the last and probably most important piece of evidence for why I think that the electroplating theory is incorrect is that there has not been a single piece of electroplated material found anywhere in the ancient Parthian Empire. Yeah, I agree with Milo. The electroplating theory doesn't really hold water. Um, I'm not even going to talk about the dendral lights because that's just silly. But electroplating, I think it's because people were reaching for that purpose. Why would you need a battery? And we do have plating of objects. There's other ways to do that. There are some theories which suggest that the battery could have been used for ceremonial purposes. There's a bit of a religious magic trick. You know, you walk up to it and you're like, yo, what's that thing? And you touch it and you go, ooh, God must be real. Now this is the second most logical explanation for what the electrical purpose could have been next to the electroplating method. But I still really have a hard time believing this, not because I don't think it's possible, but because I just don't see enough evidence for it. This also reminds me very heavily of one of my favorite books growing up, which is, uh, for those of you that have heard of it, uh, Motel of the Mysteries. And every single time I hear an archeologist not know what something is and just assume that it is, you know, like, oh, it's ceremonial purpose. It always makes me think of that. Could have been ceremonial, but I think it's a very funny cop-out that I hear so much with almost no evidence. I love the Motel of the Mysteries. I have a copy in my office. I think it's a great book and kind of a warning not to do what Milo is saying, but it sounds like Milo is suggesting that archaeologists say it's ceremonial to cover up that they don't know. I don't think that's true. We do have a joke amongst archaeologists that when we don't know what something is, we will call it ritual. But that too is a warning to us. We don't do that in academic publications. We're never going to say, well, this was ritual, unless we have absolute evidence of it. And ritual did exist. That's the bigger point. Sometimes you can prove that something was ritual because of the context, and there are even writings in cuneiform that tell us about magic in the ancient world, or the beliefs of spirits and things like this. And, you know, Milo might not like it, but in fact, the best interpretation of the Baghdad battery type is that it's a ritual object, not ever a battery, not used in that sense, but in other ways. All right, so. We're going to move on to the last theory about what it could be. As I mentioned earlier, one of the running theories for what the Baghdad battery could be is a vessel in which to store papyrus. Papyrus obviously would decompose over time, it would fall apart, it was fragile, and so it would make sense to find something to store it in which would improve its lifespan. That's not what the theory is. It's not to keep papyrus dry so that you can take it out and either read it or write on it or anything like that. Instead, it's all about putting in small written slips of paper in a ritual way. Now, I know that many people are going to say, oh, that's a cop-out, but it's not. We've got so much evidence for this that, in fact, 
we have to go with the interpretation because it's the best evidence we've got. So, first of all, many more of them than just the one that Milo says had papyrus in them. Many of them did. And secondly, we have texts that tell us about doing this kind of thing. Basically what it is, is you write spells out on paper. You do it on lead, sometimes little thin lead sheets. And you roll that up and you put it into a, usually a subterranean environment because it's going to be sent to the gods. There's two things you want to do. First of all, protect yourself from evil or maybe send evil to other people's way. There are very thin lead sheets with curses written on them. About 1,600 of them have been found from Greece out to Roman Britain. And that's exactly what they were doing. They would write, curse my neighbor because, you know, and then they would wrap it up and they'd throw it in a well or they might bury it or... This is a ritual, magical context. We've got fantastic evidence from that context of find of the four at Seleucia. We know they were found together. They were found in a rectangular foundation of a building, and that's a ritual context. We still do things like this today sometimes. We have people that go to open buildings. You know, the mayor comes out with the big golden scissors and cuts the ribbon. It's a ritual, a ceremony. We still have those, and those giant scissors are a material correlate. If an archaeologist found those, what would they think? That there was a giant around here using scissors? Why were they golden? Well, because it's a ritual. So, in foundation deposits, you will sometimes get these things to protect the building and the people who live in that building. And the three that were found were on their sides. They have these nails around them. Texts tell us the importance of nails to send the spell home. Even metaphorically, you can see that this anchors it. You can nail things together and it holds them. Well, the iron nail binds the spell. The best evidence, though, I think here is not necessarily just the fact that these things have the copper cylinders. And in fact, they don't always have just a single cylinder. One of them had three cylinders in it. Another one had ten cylinders in it. Very small. These were all blessings, probably. Because the four that were found at Seleucia were also found in the same context with what some people call magic bowls. But Waterman, who found them and these four Baghdad batteries, reports them as incantation bowls, which is a much better term. It's one we often use. So an incantation bowl is a shallow bowl that's usually found upside down. And inside it are written spells. They're usually spiraling down. And sometimes there's a drawing of a demon in chains because that's what the bowl does. It traps a demon. You put it underneath your threshold so if anything evil spirit tries to come into your house, it gets sucked into the bowl and trapped. So that's ritual and it's telling me it's ritual. We're not making this up. To claim that saying something's ritual is a cop-out, it can be, but when you've got this kind of evidence, you've got to realize that that's what these things are doing. They're functioning together with the incantation bowls in this context. It's the best context we have. You could say, well, that's not the one from Kuyut Rabawa. That one was a battery. These things are magical jars. You could say that. I can't prove otherwise. But if we only have the one battery and we can't find anything else that is the same, then we could make anything up about it. So we have to find comparenda. We've got to take that jar and say, are there other jars like it? Yes, there are. Not only there are other jars that are like it, there are jars that have similar contents. They've got copper cylinders in them. They've got bitumen in there sealing them off. Many of them have the papyrus. And outside those laying down jars, there were rods, and one of them was iron. And the texts tell us that iron is often an important one, and the different metals have different meanings. Just because the iron rod is not inside the jar, doesn't mean that it's functionally different. It means the ritual was conducted slightly differently, but they still had the same idea behind them. So I think that in the case of the one at Kuyut Rabwa, they probably wrote out the papyrus, wrapped it around the iron, and then stuck it inside the copper, metaphorically anchoring it. The, the other ones, they did that inside the copper, put the jar down, and then anchored the whole jar around it. It's still the same ritual in general. It's supposed to do the same thing. And we can understand why people are afraid of things like disease. We don't like it today. And if you didn't understand germs and viruses and bacteria, what can you do but try to comfort yourself with rituals? So in my mind, 
there is so much evidence for the ritual interpretation of these objects that we have to accept it unless we get better evidence. And these aren't the only ones we have. There are the four from Seleucia, and there are six from Tessaphon. So they're all Sasanian, so a little bit later than that Parthian, but they're all very similar. We have to think about them as a group, and I suspect that they are all ritual. Now, I mean, it seems like a half-decent idea, but we only have found four of these. One of them had papyrus in it, and the other one had acid in it. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was trying to preserve an important document, I typically wouldn't put it in acid. So then you may be thinking, why don't we just go do more studies on the battery? If the battery was analyzed in the 1930s and it's just been sitting around since then, why don't we actually break it out? We could, you know, crack the thing open and get some scientists looking at it. Well, unfortunately, we can't do that. On April 10th, first looter broke into the National Museum of Iraq. And for the next 36 hours, looters ransacked this culturally irreplaceable site unopposed. And alongside the laundry list of missing irreplaceable artifacts were a collection of four five inch tall clay jars, which today we call the Baghdad batteries. To this day, they have not been recovered and their whereabouts are still unknown. I can't confirm that. I don't know that he can either. I don't see how he could. I've got no access to the databases that were created, and the records in the Iraq National Museum were largely destroyed in the looting. So it's been very difficult to make a good inventory. They're still working on it. I know Colonel Bogdanos made a database that was as complete as he could make it. The University of Chicago has a database that talks about many of the missing things in order to be able to tell what's coming back in. But there was one thing, and I think the Guardian said that it was taken, but is it? How do they know? More likely it, it got broken or destroyed in the looting, I think. And was it with the others? Not all of them are in Baghdad anyway. Some are in Germany. The six from uh, Tessaphon, I think at least some of them are there. In fact, Pastori did analyze them in the 1980s, and he did a good job. So I think that the problem here is we're not looking at all of the evidence that we have. Maybe we could learn a lot if we could study it, but we know a lot more than has been presented. I hope that I have shown you some of what we know and why I think what I do. I do believe they're ritual objects. I believe that they believed that these things would protect them from supernatural harm. Ritual does exist, and we can find it in the archaeological record. It's very hard to understand, but from an outsider looking into an ancient ritual, or even to a modern ritual, if you're not part of the culture that's participating in it, so I will just say, um, I really do like your videos, Milo. I hope that I, I haven't come across as too negative. I'm just showing that there is more evidence. And I want you to continue doing these, and I love watching them. So I'll just say cheers, and well, uh-oh, I've just engaged in a ritual, <laughs> and say I look forward to seeing you next video. Cheers. Mm -hmm.